Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Rose and I have a sort of format, but we don't feel this is cards and tablets of jade. But as we sit here surrounded by um, Rosemary's own collection, I thought it might be interesting to start with for, for Rosemary to talk about different kinds of collections and perhaps from that we can lead into your own kind of collection. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. So how many sorts of collecting do you think there are? <laughs> I'll say five to start you off. <laughs> okay, you want me to say five. Right, okay. Um, well, I think there's sometimes people start collections um, not necessarily meaning to, but maybe an old family member has, has left them something of interest and that intrigues them. They look into it, and before you know it, they're hooked. There are other people who collect just uh, as speculation. Um, they tend to have uh, a different attitude to a lot of other collectors. Then there are people who like to specialise in one particular aspect. Some people just collect wood engravings, for example. They just love that intricacy and the small scale. But other people um, have rather quirky ideas. And for example, I've come across people who will only collect a number one of an edition, which is quite illogical. But uh, um, they have this, this sort of idea that a number one is superior. Well, it isn't, of course. It's just the same as all the other prints in the edition. Um, but this, this gives people a sense of purpose, I suppose, and um, uh, they feel it, it, it's, it's something a bit special. Um, now my, my own collection, of course, came about in a very different way, and it was really because <coughs> I was working with um, all the artists that, that you see here on the walls either in the sense that they were uh, working in the Kerwin Lithographic Studio or I was exhibiting them in the Kerwin Gallery, which I was also running in London. The, uh, the, the studio itself was a, an offshoot of a very famous uh, printing press called the Kerwin Press, which goes way back to the 1860s when it was started to print, to print music. It was started actually by, by a, a clergyman <coughs> who wanted to make music more available. So that was the, the origin of it. But by the time I joined the press, after I left art school, uh, they were very high quality general printers. So they did, they printed books and posters and um, uh, letter papers and every, everything, just general printing. But well, as we may interrupt, because I think it's, it might possibly, it is in of interest that you didn't go from college, art college, to the RCA. You chose instead to go to the Kerwin Press. And that must yes. surely have, you know, influenced matters. <coughs> yeah, I I got quite hooked on printing while I was a student and used to go to extra classes and so on. Mm. And when, when it came to the end of the four years, as it used to be in those days, I, I was offered two jobs, plus there was the possibility of going on to the Royal College to do postgraduate work there. Um, and the two jobs I was offered, one, one was with a, a very famous design studio in London, um, Run, run by um, uh, he was a, someone of German origin who had originally come from the Bauhaus, and he was very exciting personality, did wonderful design and so on. And the other job I was offered was to start right at the bottom at the Kerwin Press, mm -hmm. and um, I opted to go to the Kerwin Press because I thought that's where I would learn more, 
And so it was. And so it was indeed. Okay. Yes. Now can you to get back to the idea of your oh, collection, yes. how it started yes. from your involvement yes. so with the Curl. I, mu I must just uh, go like back a little bit as to as to why why the the studio was started. Because in the inter between the two wars, the Cohen Press had become famous for um, uh, trying to improve the quality of printed design because it was really, really terrible after the First World War. And so the person who, uh, Harold Cohen, who, who was running the press, he had the idea of persuading people like London Transport and um, Shell Petrol and, and uh, Guinness um, pubs and uh, Lions Corner House and so on <clears throat> to actually commission first-rate artists to draw posters, lithographic posters. And so this, this um, was the beginning of the tradition of, of fine artists coming to work at the Cohen and actually working directly in lithography. Now, the, the, this, this was supported wholeheartedly by people like Frank Pick, who, was, who ran the London Transport um, programme of posters, which some of you might have, might have seen in your, in your far distant youth. Um, and it was out of that that the, that the Kerwin studio became an entity on its own, and in, in 1958 was set up just to provide a facility for <coughs> artists to make editions of lithographs, not posters, mm -hmm. but fine art lithographs in editions. And so the, this, this was all in the East End, I may say, because the press was in plaster, and I used to commute there every day. But eventually, eventually, mm -hmm. artists got a bit fed up of having to go down to plaster. And so this, the studio was moved up to a basement in Tottenham, just off Tottenham Court Road. It was, um, it was quite dark, and on three sides there were pavement lights, so people, you could see people walk, walking over, which was a bit off-putting to some of the artists working there. Um, so the, it was quite a, quite a big space, but, and we had, let me think, we had three, four direct litho presses, and at that at the beginning one offset press. Um, and in one corner uh, we had we had an old machine that was still printing music, um, which used to make a great deal of clattering. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but that was that that the music press as it paid the rent really. So that was, <coughs> that was pretty important in those days when we were starting off. So, um, uh, by, by about um, uh, 62 or 3, um, we published um, a Henry Moore, which was, um, it, was ra it was rather like this one, but it was, it was in full colour. Mm -hmm. We published John Piper um, and um, uh, Joseph Herman, um, a, a really good portfolio of, of artists' work. But then I realised that it was hopeless trying to sell it from, from the basement studio. F firstly, because people wouldn't find it, and then it was, it was very sort of... There were piles and piles of paper waiting to be printed. It was, you, there were sort of corridors through piles of paper. It wasn't a sleepy gallery space. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. So um, we were very lucky to find um, a, a new gallery that had just been built about 10 minutes walk south, just off Charlotte Street. And so that's when I opened the, the <coughs> Kerwin Gallery. And of course the, 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 the main... Uh, um, uh, Thing was really to show the editions that we were publishing. But immediately artists started coming to me with prints that they had um, printed themselves and they were not lithographs, they were etchings and, and, and screen prints and lino cuts, wood cuts 
all the other media that, that, we, that we were not printing. And they were so wonderful. There was such a, such a vigour in all this new work. So I then realised that this was going to be the first proper print gallery in London. And so it was. Gosh. Um, yes, after that, after that, of course, a lot of people realised that the printmaking was a field that had enormous interest and, and, and it, wonderful <coughs> things. Did it, was the gallery open four or five days a week? Or? Uh, six days a week, right through the year. And I was running it on my own. For, mm. a, I think, the first three years, I didn't have anyone to help. I didn't have an assistant or anything, so there was no question of going out for lunch. <laughs> um, but it was so it was so exciting, so vibrant. I put on a different exhibition every month, and of course Charlotte Street, which was just at the end, was was just a wonderful place to be in because mm -hmm. at that point there was still all the old um, shops and cafes, and it, because it had been a centre where uh, refugees had settled. So there was, there was a very established German community there, an Italian community, mm -hmm. Greek, and so on, that you know, one couldn't have wanted a more, a more marvellous place to be in. So, so you were staging exhibitions of both of the artists who were with Kerwin and other artists yes. who were bringing work to yes. you? Yes, yes, yes. Can you remember your first show? Um, well, the first one was, was obviously our Cohen editions. Uh -huh. um, and the second one was a German artist called. Um, oh, his name is Steve, you know. Sorry. Um, anyway, uh, there was a terrific variety, and we had the most wonderful opening parties, as you can imagine. <laughs> um, because the, because the um, imported Algerian red. <laughs> was very cheap. <laughs> so that it was all great fun. So that's that's how it all started. So um, eventually I took over full time running the studio and the gallery, got someone in to help in the gallery. Um, and and that was the point when this the studio got really busy. Um, suddenly printmaking um, took off in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and so we had a lot of artists visiting from abroad who, some of them had grants from their home countries to come work there and uh, some of them were, came on um, under their own steam. Mm -hmm. We were commissioning artists ourselves and we had a sort of bread and butter job yeah. with, a, with an American publisher. You know, you were, you were talking about the vibrancy and the excitement and twice in our conversations you've said, you know, you really felt that the period from the 50s through to the 80s was a golden age and that, you know, you felt, <coughs> excuse me, very privileged to be in it and, you know, seeing the, these results on the wall. Yes, I, I mean, looking back in hindsight, I think really it, it, there was such an explosion of printmaking and it, 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 was, it was really very exciting. And I would say that really my collection is, um, is of that period. Mm -hmm. And it is, uh, you, you will see as you, as you go around and look at it, that uh, there's very little photography involved. I, I felt that once that photography um, <clears throat> was being used widely by artists, I rather lost interest in it. And um, <clears throat> to me, the um, the sort of ethos of that period um, was to do with the artist's relationship with their materials, and it was mm. what people used to call, you know, truth to materials. Yes. And I think that that was the <coughs> that was the sort of overriding feeling um, that artists had for the materials that they were working with. Yes, and this, that's the point that we were talking about the other day. Some people feel. It is the image, and don't care whether that image is created in oils or tapestry, whereas mm -hmm. others on the material mm -hmm. path, like as yourself and Henry were, both feel mm -hmm. that you know the material mm -hmm. is part of the image. Yes, it, it is certainly, certainly to me. 
which is which is why you'll see such a variety of, of, of work in this collection because they're all things that I think show the uh, possibilities of, this, of the particular medium. Um, later on at the end you can have a look at a few things I've brought along but we're not going to, we're not going to dwell too much into the, the detail of that. Yeah, but there are these, there's some <coughs> intriguing things up on this platform up here. Um, we didn't go into the collectors who were doing from sheer speculation, speculatory grounds, is that side of things too? Well, that, that really, um, I suppose, does drive a great many, yeah. great many people. And um, I just don't sort of think, think that way. But um, what can I say? Undoubted, undoubtedly, that, that's one very, you know, big, big area of, of collecting. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think it's, as in all collecting, whether it's for your more personal reasons or not, <clears throat> it's very important that you find out what you're actually interested in and what you're buying. Mm -hmm. And uh, if... I, I, if, I would say that if anyone wanted to speculate on um, particularly in the printmaking field, that they should be prepared to keep something for at least 40 years before they resell it. Unless, unless and until, say four years ago, when um, people who had bought what was most fashionable at that point and were interested in keeping something maybe for six months and selling it on, that, that was a very lucrative area for speculators. But as soon as we got to, say, 2008, and we had the, the crash, then uh, the people who had speculated in what was fashionable at that time I think they're going to have to keep that stuff for at least 40 years, if not more, before there will be any revival of interest in it. I mean, the whole thing is cyclical. Now, now people are interested in the 50s and 60s and the early 70s. Mm -hmm. Ten years ago, nobody cared about it at all. It's a very peculiar thing. Now, in one of your... Maxims, one of the forces, persuasive forces, when you were buying prints, was that they be the print be an excellent example of its kind. Yeah. And I think that that is um, gives a great variety to your. Yes, it does. To your yes. to, to your collection. Yes. So That's that a, that makes it a, sort of a rather unusual collection, I think. Whereas this house is very densely hung. And I mean, it took me like 10 minutes just to get from the lounge to the loo because the walls were so intriguing. <laughs> and since, of course, my bare walls, because it was a lot of stuff <coughs> in it, I've now dug out more stuff to put on the um, fill up the gaps. I would be very interested to explore, I don't know if this is the right place, the sometimes intriguing relationship between the collector and the collection. Um, have you read that Bruce Chatwood book called Utz about the man who collects porcelain no, in Prague? No, well, he's a collector of a very particular sort. Mm. I mean, you know... People do become very obsessed. Uh -huh. Yes. That's why I said, you know, sometimes people will, will only collect one really quite small area, yes. but it will mm. try and get everything that's yeah. ever been you know, done in a particular way. It's, uh, it's very odd. I think, I mean, those people are obsessives, then they're not collecting for their love of art. I, yes. Yes. I would, I mean, I would prefer uh, people to have things on their walls because they, they're intrigued with them, they love them, they mm -hmm. see something different every moment. Mm -hmm. That's, that to me is, is why it's worthwhile. Yes. 
But I mean, you, you, you know, you were talking about by virtue of being in such a privileged position, how you built up your collection. And I mean, sometimes there were swaps, weren't there? Yeah, but there's a lot of... There's a wonderful Elizabeth Frink hair, which was... Yes, it's just, just around the corner. Yeah. yeah. Well, there was this, there's really a, a strong tradition amongst artists that, of swapping work. So it, it was not unusual for us to, mm. to exchange things between us, uh, which is a very nice thing to do. But then, you see, we did a lot of, of printing with Henry Moore over years and years and years. And Stanley Jones, who, who was the, the master printer, and I used, used to go down to Hoglands almost once a month for year after year after year. And we would be taking with us um, proofs for him to look at um, and also um, finished editions for him to sign. There's a, there's a photograph here of him sign, you can have a look afterwards of him mm. signing, signing some, some prints. Um, Henry was very, a very intriguing person because it, it was just at the, at the time when he um, had become world famous mm -hmm. and his uh, larger pieces of sculpture were being installed in all the capitals of the world. And so there were constant visitors down there. And um, Henry got fed up with them because they took up so much time. So when, when um, Stanley and I used to go down there, he would sort of welcome us with open arms and we'd go off to, to, to <coughs> one of the, um, um, the buildings in the, uh, in the grounds. Because it, Hoglands was originally a farm, and there was the old farmhouse, and dotted around were barns and sheds of all sorts and <coughs> chicken houses. One of the chicken houses was turned into the studio for lithography. I mean, to to look at uh, mm -hmm. all the proofs and things, not to print there. There was another sh a smaller shed where um, <coughs> he had a small etching press that somebody came from mm -hmm. London to. Um, to play around with him and that. And he had another small shed that his was his maquette studio and so on. Mm. So we used to we used to go to the um, um, the chicken shed for lithography. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> and what it what he what he liked Stanley to do was to do a whole series of colour proofs. And Stanley actually knew, had worked with Henry for so long that he knew um, some of the sort of uh, colour groupings that, that Henry liked. And so he took upon himself to do perhaps 20 different versions of one image. And um, so we'd, we'd spread them out and, and there would be sort of long deliberations and great discussions and so on. And then we'd hang them up and so that Henry could see them under different times of the day, different light and so on. And eventually, eventually, it would come to a conclusion that that was, that was the image you liked best. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so we'd take that back to the press and print, print the edition, however many copies it was. And the number of copies that we printed varied very much according to whether Henry himself was publishing it, occasionally we published, um, or whether it was another publisher. Um, and when um, his, his gallery, uh, Marlborough Fine Art, um, actually became more and more prescriptive in the sense that um, they, they didn't want him to work with with other publishers. Mm -hmm. So Henry used to go to Italy to work with um, with a famous etching studio called Il Basante. He used to go to Zurich to Wolfenburger. Uh, he used to go to Paris to work with Frelo. Um, and gradually 
all these things diminished and he was working mainly, mainly with us. Um, <coughs> but <coughs> occasionally, <coughs> occasionally a foreign publisher <coughs> would come to an arrangement that that they would um, they would do a, a special edition that um, uh, that would be, <coughs> for example, there was a, a French collectors club um, who were devoted to portfolios of artists' work, and those would usually be in, a, in an, an edition of fifty. This sort of club was. Um, <coughs> Um, would, there would be a strict membership um, and people paid a lot of an annual fee to mm -hmm. be a member of the club and then they would have the opportunity once a year to have a portfolio yeah. which might be one artist or it might be several artists yeah. and sometimes they would also do two editions there would be a small edition maybe 25 copies on a special paper, which uh, would be a very special uh, portfolio. And then they would do another edition on a, a more ordinary sort of paper. Might be, might be 75 copies, so altogether there would be 100. But these special ones would be more expensive, of course, um, and rarer. Be, yes, and I think that as you've made reference to Henry Moore and the chicken shed, you can only be fair and bring in the story of Barbara Hepworth and the Palais de Dance. <laughs> mm. And the whole story from loading the car up. This is, a, I think, a sign of um, Prince collecting that perhaps not everyone is familiar with. The signing off of the edition in the times gone by. <laughs> well... <coughs> Um, we were printing on special paper, handmade paper, made for Barbara Hepworth that included a watermark of her signature. This was not uncommon for special editions. And this handmade paper was extremely heavy. And I had um, an old um, Morris Traveller, which was a splendid car for carrying stuff around because when you opened the back doors it was absolutely flat and quite big. So I used to load up the car um, with perhaps four or five editions and um, drive to Paddington Station and put it on a train at about 11 o'clock at night and, and, <clears throat> and then there was a, a sleeping car. And when we, we got to Penzance in the morning about um, Half past five or six, and uh, we'd offload the car off the train, <clears throat> and then I would drive from Penzance right over the top down to down to St Ives, which was a wonderful drive early in the morning. You said it was lyrical. Absolutely stunningly beautiful, and so I'd arrive in St Ives quite early when there you know, wasn't much traffic or anything. And the first time I went, I didn't quite know the layout. Now, Barbara's studio, which is, is, the, is now what is, is open as part of the uh, Tate's uh, St. Ives, is, is not, not a very big building, um, but it is halfway up a steep hill. Mm -hmm. And I found, because the car was laden with this heavy, heavy handmade paper, I couldn't get up the hill. So I left the car at the bottom of the hill, walked up, and talked to one of Barbara's assistants. And he said, have you tried going up backwards in reverse gear? Well, I wasn't, I wasn't very good at cars, and it never occurred to me, but actually reverse gear is, is lower. Uh, and, uh, so <laughs> I went up backwards. <laughs> um, and just... On the other side of the of uh, Back Hill West, um, and just a little bit further up, <coughs> was a building that Barbara had taken over, which was once a Palais de Danse, and she used it to store all the sculpture that was either not out on exhibition, <coughs> or had come back for repair, or was work in progress, that sort of thing. 
So the whole place was absolutely full of marvellous stuff. Um, and so we would set about her signing and she'd get one of her assistants to sharpen up a dozen uh, 2B pencils and have them all in a row, waiting for her to pick it up until it got blunt and got another one. So I, I would be handing you know, the sheets of paper over, putting them on the other part. And so <clears throat> we would do this. Well, it took several days because she was already quite frail by then. But she had, she'd, she'd been through a very nasty bout of cancer and was still quite frail. So we had to do it in, uh, in, in brief lots. Um, but um, she and I just got on very well. She let me buy one of her bronzes, which I've still got to say. Yeah. Um, and of course at the end of the session she would give me one of the lithographs. So there are two here in this exhibition. There's one over there and one oh no, one one here and um, I don't know where the other one is. Downstairs over there. Over there. And so the same thing happened with Henry. Uh, at the end of the session he would um, he would give one to me and one to Stanley. Uh, and this again was was the tradition um, that people who had been much involved in in the production um, would be acknowledged in this kind way. Mm. So that's why you'll find quite a few of the prints here have, have got a, a dedication, um, which I hope people don't mind. Um, no, but, I'm, I'm, but, I'm sure people. <laughs> are all too greedy for the dedication. <laughs> I don't think they'll mind a shot or at all. Not at all. Well, it does, in, I suppose it makes them a bit special, it makes it, you know where they've come from. Yeah. That's the, yeah. That's the thing. Now, we were talking about the weight of that paper which you slipped down to some yes. tiles and yes. set up this little chain work. Um, what about, I, I think, it would be terribly interesting, Rosemary, if you spoke a little bit about paper itself, which is so vital in in um, in the world of printmaking. Yeah, you can start off anywhere. I don't think I don't think people realise how important the paper is um, to the the choice by the artist. That uh, paper is is absolutely wonderful material. It's incredibly strong. It's it's got this this heritage of the background of handmade paper making. Unfortunately the there's no longer any paper being made um, in Britain anymore. I think the last mill closed uh, a, a few years ago. There's still mills in, in Italy and France. Um, and, and certainly, certainly in um, in the Far East, in, in Korea and, and Japan, um, to a less extent in China, but the the because the the, the printing changes um, sometimes quite dramatically on on different papers. So part of the proofing process is to find out which paper is most suitable. Um, I mean, for, for example, you, you don't use a heavily sized paper for lithography. The, the sizing impedes the, um, the process of the, of the dampening um, and the inking um, of, of the image. But for etching, where you normally use damp paper, you want the paper to be strong to withstand being damped and then dried and so on. <clears throat> so the paper is, is, is usually fortified uh, with size. Uh, and so, and for example, as I would mention Japanese paper. Some people do like the texture of Japanese paper because it's made with particularly long fibred 
uh, plant material and, and has its own special quality. Mm. But it can be the devil to print on, frankly. The Japanese paper. It can be. A lot of it has very unusual plant material. Yes, and, and that can lift off under pressure um, and really give you nightmares. Um, uh, uh, somewhere, I think it may be downstairs, there's, um, um, there's, a, uh, there's a print which is, which is on what we call Chine Collé, which is, is interesting to see. Let's see if I can find it. It's actually the, this, this rather funny one of, of uh, uh, Laurent Hardy. Well, what the artist has done was actually to have uh, laid a piece of Japanese paper on the background paper and then printed on it. This, this gives you a sort of a, a, a tonal effect. Why it's called, we, we, we call it sheen, because when the Oriental papers were originally imported into Europe um, back in the 17th century, it was the custom that almost everything came from China. Mm -hmm. So even, even um, say, papers from northern India were called Chinese. Mm -hmm. Japanese papers were called Chinese. So, um, so that, that, that sort of label, label has stuck. But you'll find, you'll find in, in, uh, lots of different papers used here. Um, for example, the, just, just round the corner here, no, mm -hmm. just round the corner on, the, on your way downstairs is, is a wood engraving, um, and that th th those are usually printed on a really fine grained paper in in order to to pick up all the delicacy of the work. So you choose papers depending on what you're trying to print mm -hmm. and, and the requirements. Good. Now some other things that I think people might not know which are actually you know involved in, in imprinting and I, I was intrigued to learn how you have to be such a have such long antenna vis-a-vis -vis the weather for the day you are printing it, it can be it can be very important mm -hmm. because uh, particularly in lithography where you're um, you're, you're working with, with water and, and ink. Um, if, the, if the humidity is too high, the paper's going to stretch too much. And you may have to watch that and maybe even dry your paper a bit before you print. On the other hand, if it's very, very dry weather, as we've been having recently, you'll, you'll probably have to mist your paper a bit in order to um, um, give it more flexibility and, and uh, um, just make it make it. Mm, I mean, you were talking work. about grades of damping, misting, soaking. Absolutely. I mean, these are the these are the all the variables that go mm. that go into this form of this form all of. All the printing. chemistry. Yeah. Yes, and for example, paper makers, they would uh, the the, ha the handmade paper makers would never make paper in August because the, the wind's in the wrong direction, <laughs> which sounds funny. But of course what happened when the sheets were made and they were still uh, semi-damp, they were <coughs> hoisted up into an airy loft-like construction mm -hmm. and, and, and were air-dried. And they must be air-dried slowly because if it's too quick, your paper is going to dry unevenly, it will cockle, it won't, won't remain flat, it'll, it'll always be difficult. Mm -hmm. So, yes, it's very important. So in certain parts of the world, um, certain richer parts of the world, like America, for example, you'll find that the, most of the studios are air-conditioned. But uh, to balance that out, yes. To, to try to keep mm -hmm. that... Um, that's that's yeah. all equanimity, I think. Yeah. Rosemary, I'm going to try now snatch a little time about how you started printmaking today. And this is a truly sort of life enhancing story involving <laughs> kitchen tables and typewriters. It really is. Mm -hmm. Well, I, 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 I
Well, after I'd been um, running the Kerwin uh, Gallery and the Kerwin Studio for uh, a number of years, um, it, a very difficult situation was arising insofar as the, our parent Kerwin Press, which was still down in Plasto, was um, finding itself in a situation that commercial printing technology was changing very, very fast. This, this, this was the, the time of all the um, strikes in printing, you remember in whopping and all, mm -hmm. all, that, all that business. And I'm afraid that the press was too old-fashioned and it couldn't compete. And, and eventually it closed. And so at that point, I was not at all sure what was going to happen to the studio. And there were, uh, there were accountants sort of buzzing around like flyers. Um, and I was very apprehensive. So I decided at that point that I would do what I always wanted to do, which was to start writing about printmaking and try to um, encourage people to understand all its nuances. Um, so I'd been, uh, I, I had a, a regular page in, in a magazine that, that was published then called Arts Review and eventually I decided that printmaking needed a magazine of its own. There, there was an, ordinary art magazines more or less ignored printmaking and I think it was largely because and the art critics who were writing in them were so ignorant about printmaking that they, they just didn't want to touch it. So I set about thinking how could a printmaking magazine work. And I, I spent about a year researching how magazines are put together, how they're distributed. I knew about how they were printed. Um, but there were so, so many aspects of it completely new to me. So I, I, did, a, I did a lot of research and um, eventually I went to the Henry Moore Foundation and asked them if they would give me a grant to do um, the first few issues, more or less to sort of test the water. And I did the, 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 the first issue, um, and I must explain, at this particular time, I had had a lot of problems with, with my eyesight. Um, I'd had uh, um, um, detached retinas and various things which saved my sight, but it was, I couldn't it, I couldn't really uh, work on a computer screen. I couldn't see it well enough. So I thought, well, um, that computers at that stage were not all important. Um, so I felt that was not going to inhibit me. Um, so because I knew Henry Moore very well, and, and I was known to the foundation, so they gave me £5,000 which was brilliant. Um, so when I'd done the first, the first issue, which, um, as you said, on my computer, and then pasted up, and then the printers photographed, pasted up, printed and so on, then I had all these piles of copies, what was I going to do with them? <laughs> um, so <clears throat> the first issue, I, I, I posted out free to an awful lot of people. But then also persuaded uh, the major galleries to sell it. So I used to go off front down to the, the These table. major galleries got yeah. hand delivery. A, a hand delivery, absolutely. It was all done by hand. Piles of envelopes going to the post office and so on. So it was it was it was practically hand done. Um, and it has lost. Yeah, but the end the end of the fourth issue, I had a lot of support. Because um, as soon as people saw it, they started sending me money to subscribe. So I built up a lot of subscribers by the, the fourth issue. But then, 
there was a major financial crisis in the country. This was 1990, 89 to 90, and it was another of these oil collapses. Yeah, yeah. And everyone was going bankrupt all over the place. My printer went bankrupt. Nobody paid for advertising in the magazine. Um, it, it was pretty desperate. Um, and I, I, I had enough money from subscribers and sales to think, well, I can do one or two more issues. But it had also grown by that time. So I thought, well, I really, I can't cope with all this, you know, sending them out by post and everything as well. So I, I looked, I looked for a, um, I thought, well, I will, all these supporters, I'll ask them if they would like to uh, buy shares. Well, I got a lot of people, a lot of people interested, but when I did the maths, I realised it wasn't really going to work, there weren't quite enough. So I then set about finding a partner, and eventually, by sheer luck, um, I, I, I found a, a very charming man who published... Are you getting rid of that? I think there's a sort of pendulous <laughs> drops, yes. Um, <laughs> my, my partner was, uh, was a publisher of, of medical journals, quite, quite a sort of separate subject. But he had all the setup to um, for the to, to to do the subscriptions and the distribution and all that side of things. So um, so that's that's how we we proceeded, and it, and it went from strength to strength. And I tried to make it as international as possible, so it goes all over the world. Uh, so that's, that's and it's almost are there are there. Other printmaking magazines in England now? No, no. no Stores, it's no, still sort of. No. There are there in uh, there's Soldiering. there's one there's one in this country devoted to historical prints. Yes, yes. And and, and also in the states, mm -hmm. but there's nothing else actually anywhere that covers the whole field. Mm -hmm. And is um, you know. So, wow. yes, it's going strong, it's going strong. And, I mean, what is so intriguing was how, how it came about through your friends. And you remember, I remember you were telling me that Diana Atchill helped you with editorial tasks. She was a near neighbour of mine when I was living in London. And every now and again I would have a bit of a problem and I'd, she'd, she'd uh, give me some really good advice. Oh, but one of the really dangerous things that happened, the first issue... Um, we had a, a big thing about what makes an original print. <clears throat> and if I can remind you, that was the time when there was a huge business in selling reproductions, getting people to sign a number of reproductions, and advertising them in such a way that people thought that they were original prints, but they were just reproductions. So I've, I was up in arms at this, and quite a number of the rest of people around the world were. And so the first issue, we had big, several articles on this, this, this very complicated subject. Well, somehow, one of the biggest uh, reproduction publishers in this country got wind of this and put an injunction on me. This was before I'd even published the first issue. Well, that was a little bit frightening because I'd never come across anything so difficult in my whole life. So um, I, I managed to find another angel, a friend, who sponsored me to get advice from one of the leading uh, libel uh, lawyers in London, a firm called Carter Ruck. <laughs> who, of course, charged astronomical fees that I could never even dream of. But this angel came to, to, the, to our aid and went through what I had written and what one of other people had written, and we subtly changed one or two sentences. Got away with it. <laughs> <laughs> it's marvelous. I mean, that, 
the whole magazine seemed to have been started and run on a kind of mixture of mad ze zealotry and bloody mindedness. But it's, you know, that's a lovely story. I, so, yeah. I don't know whether people would like a time for questions. I think what I'd like to get Rosemary to do is just to talk briefly about the possible future of printmaking, and then if there are questions from people, we can handle them then. So, I mean, yes, so you, were, you were saying that you were not terribly keen yourself or when, when the photographic image made it a, a stern input into the into well, photography. Well, um, I'm, I suppose because of my age and everything, mm -hmm. I have more sympathy with artists of, yeah. of, this, of this sort of period. And I never felt that sympathetic toward uh, photographic imagery. And of course, it, it became um, the most, I suppose, e exciting um, new development in screen printing mm -hmm. um, uh, towards the end of the 60s and, and into the 70s, and has um, been one of, one of the sort of major play players since. Yeah. Um, my, um, and then, of course, we got uh, the c computer imaging coming in too, which is... It's, it's terribly attractive, particularly for young artists, to explore because you know new ways of working, deciding what can we do with it, and so on. <clears throat> my my own personal feeling about that is, um, yes, it, it it has given artists um, a lot of interesting ways of thinking, um, but my criticism of it is that the that most of the uh, computer software um, has been designed um, for office use and until very recently, until perhaps things like the iPad, that, um, that its possibilities were limited by the designers who came from a completely yeah. uh, different um, approach. And and in the end, it becomes limiting for artists. That that's that's my position. It may it may it may not always be that, um, and it may be, for example, that it would be it would be quite interesting to collect some of the earliest digital work. But but there's such a big question mark over its longevity. Whereas all these original prints. Everyone has used the best possible paper so that they're going to last a long time. We choose the ink so that they don't fade. You cannot be sure of, you know, of digital imaging, I'm afraid. I agree it has got better um, and some of the, um, some of the new uh, digital printing machinery has, has tried to get away from um, dye-based inks to uh, um, pigment-based inks, uh, therefore <coughs> um, giving the, the, the means the image is less fugitive. But nevertheless, mm -hmm. there are big question marks. There also one of the yeah, things yes. that came up in, one, in our conversations were the, what has been brought about by health and safety. I mean, you were talking about oh, people no. just Leaning over, snorting effort pubes, hands, <laughs> plunging the bars. Well, when I was a, a student, there was, I mean, nobody thought about health and safety, so we sort of leaned over the acid bath, picked up plates out of the acid without thinking what it might be doing to us. And during the, particularly um, uh, from the 70s onwards, there was a, was a very strong movement to try to persuade artists to use safer materials. So many of the things that we were using were carcinogenic. Uh, you know, yeah, you said positive really, side of really this, People do have to consider the situation very carefully yes. to come up with equivalences. Well, we, yes, so, so we all had to put our thinking caps on and had to, had to think, could we find alternatives for a lot of these materials? And by thinking about what, what might be good alternatives, we had to think 
go right back to the basics of the process. What was happening? What was the what was the what were the chemical reactions going on? And in a way, that has brought about a much deeper mm. understanding of of the techniques that that we use. So. My, my own sort of feeling is that there's a change in spirit going on, that people are actually pretty getting bored with um, a, a, a lot of imagery that has been produced rather, rather quickly and slickly, and not necessarily with much artist um, input. Um, I mean, for example, now in art schools, students are actually asking for life drawing classes, actually wanting, wanting to go back to materials and what you can do with them, going back to some of the traditions that have served us so well for hundreds and hundreds yeah. of years. So I think that eventually we will see a revival of interest in what I would call traditional yes. printmaking. But it will be, it'll be different, of course it will be different. It's yeah. bound to be different. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be exciting too. And then I think, before we let, let them at us with questions, <laughs> that very intriguing story about your friend's husband and the Mexicans process which have fallen uh, yes, over, into desperate. Over there, over there, you'll see a little black square. <laughs> and this is this is by this is Metzitant by an artist called Mark Balakian, who was from uh, originally from Armenia, cha uh, uh, trained initially as an architect, but then went to the Slade. And he um, he got interested in this method called mezzotint, which by that time had almost completely disappeared. It had been tremendously popular during the, from the 17th century, the 18th and the 19th. And it's particularly popular in Britain because it was used as a method of reproducing paintings in black and white. Um, the the process gives you probably more subtlety than any of the other intaglio methods, but it's very uh, it's very labour intensive and very long winded, um, and it was it was so popular in this country. It was once called the the, the English manner, particularly during the eighteenth and nineteenth centuries. It was used a lot for portraiture. Um, and just very briefly to tell you that a, a metal plate is indented all over with a, by, by a, uh, um, a toothed tool that made little pits all over it, completely covering it. And um, um, if you had um, put ink onto it at that stage, it would print total black. And the idea is that with a burnishing tool, which is just just something like that, a smooth, smooth metal tool. You would burnish the metal plate back to uh, reducing the size of the little pits of ink, reducing the depth. Be you'd actually be flattening the surface of the copper, so that each pit took a variable amount of ink. Deeper pits left would still print black, but you could burnish it away until it was almost a smooth surface which didn't take any ink at all. So you've got the, the widest range of tones possible. Anyway, so Mark had, had uh, been reading up about this, couldn't, couldn't find um, anybody who was doing it any longer, but he found an old uh, 19th century manual and he taught himself um, from scratch how to do it again, and made his tools and so on. And you'll find now there's a lot of artists are doing mezzotints. Mm. I found it a very, I don't know, yes, poignant I mean, this is what I'm talking about, story. revival, you know, that the, 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 the people, people get interested again mm. in an old technique because of its special qualities. Thank you so much, Rosemary. Are there any questions that people might like to ask Rosemary?
Okay, there we go, there we go. Well, I'm, unfortunately, I have to go as short as I'm glad I was able to come and speak to me. But um, you've obviously met a lot of artists here, famous name artists, who were all probably very meticulous with their work. Could you tell us who was the most awkward person to work with? Who was, <laughs> and, and by contrast, who was the most easy to go with? I couldn't, I couldn't, couldn't. dare tell you. <laughs> 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 oh, was oh, but there were quite a few. There were quite a few. <laughs> and they, they were often the younger ones who were full of themselves, <laughs> to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. There were one or two older ones who also were very tricky. Um, but a lot of, uh, I would say the vast majority of people were delightful to work with because they knew that we were trying to facilitate what they wanted to do. But I mean, really funny things happened. I, I'd forgotten to tell you this, but um, in lithography, which, is, as you know, is, is based on the antipathy of grease and water, um, the artist uh, draws either on um, lithographic stone or or grain sink, um, and they, if they were not terribly experienced, they would forget, they'd forget what's, what things had grease in them. So there was one chap, who shall be nameless, who went out and got himself a sausage roll, came back, <laughs> and laid it on the side of the plate. <laughs> and of course, when, you know, when we came to print the plate, there was the footprint of the sausage roll. <laughs> And another time, which was even more, more, in, more difficult for us, it was, we really didn't know what had happened, but um, I'd, I'd, I'd commit, commissioned an artist to, to do um, a series about follies around the country. And so I'd sent him off to, I think I sent him off to Ironbridge. And so he was doing one of the, one of the Ironbridge, and he was drawing on the spot, took the plate with him on plein air. And when we got it back and, and, uh, and worked on it, the whole thing was speckled all over with, with white spots. And eventually, um, we realised that he had dandruff. Oh, yeah. And, 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 yeah. It's that sensitive, it's that tricky. So... <laughs> That was diplomatically handled marvellous. I think the gentleman next to the last part of the job. Thank you both so much for this marvellous privilege exchange that we can all share. It's really fantastic. And uh, I wanted to ask if you had worked with three particular artists that I enjoy very much because I, I, I love their approach to buildings and so on. And they're Barbara Jones, Paul Hogarth, oh, yes. and David Gentleman. And I'd love oh, yes, to hear if you have recollections of them. I would be all thrilled, three. thrilled to, bits to hear them because they're hanging the walls and everything. Yes. And I, I bought from your collection earlier the Barbara Jones of the um, lovely Scottish pineapple. Oh, you put the pineapple? Yes. Have and, you? And, and my wife, Kay, took great exception to it. Because, as she said, I don't like the Geraldine pink background. And I said, darling, I'm looking at the building, never mind the Geraldine. So we're learning, she's learning to live with it, but it's not this, the Yes, this was, this was uh, another suite of follies that, that, that I commissioned various people. And, um, um, uh, yes, we sent Barbara up to, to uh, Stirlingshire, where there's the most extraordinary building in, in the shape of a pineapple which is now owned by the Landmark Trust. Indeed, and yes. You can go and stay there, actually. Um, yes, uh, uh, but I don't know whether you knew, but Barbara and her partner uh, were avid collectors of folk art. Indeed, yes. And uh, they, they lived in a basement flat in, in Hampstead. And you could hardly get into this flat for all, this, all the curious objects that they collected over their, over their career. Um, or, you know, they were dolls and things made of horseshoe nails, um, a lot of stuff to do with barges, which they were very keen on. And the two of them had published a number of books, um, particularly about British, British folk art. And she was a lovely person. She was an absolute darling. Lovely, lovely to work with. David Gentleman, uh, splendid, splendid, lovely man. 
Um, he, he lived in, in Camden Town and he was uh, very conscientious. He usually preferred to take plates home with him and draw them up at home. Um, we, sent, well, we sent him off once to, um, to South Carolina. I've got two of those prints. Oh, have I was you? thrilled the bits have the you? following in Tetbury. There's a particular antique oh, shop there. Yes. And we found to the, uh, the chapel at. Oh, um, the chapel, yes. Uh, uh, and I've actually been to the chapel, I can't remember have the name. You? Of yes, so. this is. And the brick house in Charleston. Yes. Fabulous. Be fabulous. Yes, yes. They were lovely, weren't they? Yes. So, so you know, we. we um, commission people to go all over the place to to do series. I mean, the thing was that um, we we realised that there was a sort of um, ongoing nostalgia in the British public for uh, historical buildings and places of interest. Uh, in, we, we revived the the whole idea of the topographical print by um, asking these artists. And Paul Hogarth, of course, who was very prolific as well. And they were all lovely to work with and uh, very hard working. That suite of David Gentleman, so there's some images he's done of Bath, aren't there? Yes, which yes. I don't have yes, I yeah, said, yes. I, was I came to Bath. Through Carolyn? Yes, I commissioned him to. And I, oh. came, I came to Bath uh, with my husband and we went round and had a look at. At, at the sort of places that we thought were iconic, and um, one of them was was uh, Dundas, Dundas oh, Aqueduct, yes. and the intriguing thing is that um, when, if you if you happen to to see that print, and you actually offer it up as it were at Dundas, it, something doesn't work, and <clears throat> we realised that he'd somehow fiddled the perspective mm -hmm. so that he was. It was as if he was suspended in mid-air, <laughs> in the position from where he drew it. So he, quite how he did it, I don't know, but, but that was, uh, you know, it's really, really right. very clever. Thank you so, so much. Yes. Good. One last question. Here we are. It's mostly sad to hear of the demise of English paper making. Is it purely a cost issue, or yes. Korean, Japanese and Chinese paper? Considered not big enough market for it here, unfortunately, and the uh, the people making papers just died out. It was a you know it was a profession that had, or a, if you like, a, an industry really that had come come to sort of natural natural end, and it was supplanted by mold made papers and, and, and machine made papers. But just give me the opportunity just. Just to, to mention um, what our handmade paper, how, what it was made from and so on. Um, because I've just been doing a bit of research. I live in Coombe Down, and in Coombe Down there was once a, a very famous paper mill. <coughs> I was doing some research on that for a, uh, a talk. And I hadn't realised that the rag trade throughout Europe was immense. And in Britain, we, we imported almost all the rags that, that Europe could produce. They came over in, in shiploads um, up to the point where, where uh, the Portuguese government actually banned the export of rags because they were be, their own paper making was being depleted so much. Mm -hmm. um, and so you could, a few of the older members here will, will remember the rag and bone men and that's what they were doing, they were collecting rags for the paper trade. And so the first thing that happened was that the, the, the rags were sorted, uh, the, the, the best ones were, were linen. And, and the reason why we use rags is, is because the fibres had been softened by wear. Um, uh, and then, of course, cotton was the sort of second best. And so there were armies of women in these, in these paper mills who were busy cutting off all the buttons and the elastic and, and, and all, the, all that sort of stuff and sorting the rags into piles. And then, and then, there, uh, then there were another group of women who had a great big knife in front of them and they would slice up the rags into, into small pieces. And, and then it went into a beater 
um, and was macerated and beaten and beaten until the individual fibres were separated out. And, and that um, suspended water, the, the pulp, was, was what the paper was made of. So it was labour intensive. M most commercial printing didn't want to use handmade paper because it, it was no longer easy to feed through machines and so on. So there was just a, just a gradual dwindling trade. And the, the continental mills that are still making are really for this really small niche market, mm. which is quite fine art. So that's the sad history. And in fact, down around in this part of the world, in the West Country, was one of the major areas for, mm. for paper making. There's quite a few mills around Bath. Mm. And the, the other area also was, was Kent. Yeah. Um, Rosemary, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> That was, you know, the stories of the...